I am so excited to be here today. My name is Melinda Emerson, but my nickname is the Small Biz Lady. I'm considered one of America's top small business experts because my mission is to end small business failure. And I'm so excited to be here with you all today because what we're going to talk about is the top thing you need to be considering to move your business forward with your marketing in 2017. Is there anybody interested in that? Okay, well, I must be in the right place. I flew all the way from Philadelphia to give you this news, so I'm glad to know that I'm in the right place. So as we start thinking about marketing, what is the number one thing that comes to your mind? I tell you the thing that comes to my mind is, God, everybody's tweeting and blogging, and, and it's becoming more and more difficult to be noticed online, is it not? And the thing about it is, is, the other thing that's going on is there's a new platform every five minutes. How many of you guys are trying to figure out how to use Snapchat for your business? Okay, well, I'm going to talk to you all a little bit about why that may or not, may not be a good thing for your business at this time. You know, when we first started this journey in business where social media became the hot thing about 2008, 2009, everybody was about likes and friends and followers. Well, nowadays, it's about click-throughs, it's about open rates, it's really about engagement. So what I want to talk to you about this afternoon is what I'm going to call my 10 R's to build a revenue revolution in your business in 2017. Does that sound good? All right, so here's the first R that I want to give you. Review your Google Analytics. It's free. We all have it on our websites, and if you don't, you really should. But that's where, if you want to start building a new marketing plan for your business in 2017, you got to start with what you already know. So what do we want to look at our Google Analytics for? Well, number one, where is your best referral traffic coming from? Because that's going to tell you what social media sites you probably really should be investing your time in. The second thing you want to know is what keywords are you already ranking for? You want to look at your bounce rate, and that's the amount of time people spend on your website. You just want to look at what's going on up under the hood of your website, and that's a great place to start. The second thing you want to do, and this is your second R, I want you to reinvent your website experience. We all know that our website is our number one sales tool, yes? We also know that our number one goal is to turn our website into a cash register, yes? All right, so how are you going to do that if your website sucks? It's not going to work too well. So I want you to think about what is your website load speed? What does your website look like from a mobile device? 47% of people are just looking at your website from a mobile device. So you've got to make sure that you're ready, that your buttons are easy to use, that it's not too cluttered. Have you ever gone to a website that looks like a hoarder built it? Their navigation is crazy. you got too much stuff, too many options. Listen, when you give people too many options, what happens? They don't pick anything. So you want to make it easy. You want to make sure you have a call to action on every page so that your folks know exactly what you want them to do. And then the last thing you want to think about as you reinvent your website experience, you've got to know what your shopping cart experience is like. Because what is the number one thing that causes shopping cart abandonment? Shipping charges. How many of you guys knew that? Free shipping is actually the way to go. So how do you do that? Well, you raise the price slightly of your product so you can make shipping free, right? It's, it's a game, but you really have to think about people really get turned off to the cost of shipping. So you've got to think about that, and you should have someone go through your experience. How many of you only offer one way for people to pay? Some people don't like PayPal, some people don't like it. You know, make sure you have two or three options for people to pay you on your website. And that is how you're going to make sure that you've got a great website experience. But the other thing is, what's your content look like on your website? Is it easy to find? Is it organized well? Is it easy to search? That's another thing you've got to think about with your website experience. Now, the other thing you might want to think about as well as 
you need to reassess your market. A lot of things have changed in the last year, and you not only want to look at what's going on in your industry, is there any technology that's changing your industry, you also want to look at how your customers are using social media, because they might have migrated from the thing that you first, depending on how long you've been in business, you might have found them on Facebook. Now they're hanging out on Instagram, right? You need to just make sure that you're checking in on how your customers are using social media. Because again, it's gonna determine where you need to invest your time and your money. And then you want to reevaluate your keywords and hashtags. Depending on your industry, your keywords could be changing every four to six weeks in your industry. The other thing you've got to realize is that hashtags are extremely important, especially if you're using Snapchat and Instagram. For my business, the number one hashtag that we use is small biz chat, and we've actually gone to the, to the effort of trademarking it. Small Biz Chat is actually a weekly chat that I do live every week on Twitter where I answer people's small business questions. And I've been doing it for seven and a half years. And what we realized was a lot of people were bootlegging our hashtags. So we went and trademarked it so that we would have more control because we consider it a brand like anything else in our business. You need to figure out what the hashtags are so that you can get engaged and involved in the conversations that are taking part in your industry. If you are using Instagram, hashtags are the only way people are going to find you. So you want to make sure that you know not only what the latest keywords are for your industry, what your key hashtags are, but you also want to pick your focus keyword. And that's going to be the keyword you want to be known for on the internet. It's the one you're going to spend your money to use in SEO. These are the things that you want to figure out. And depending on your industry, these things could really be changing. Now the fifth R I want to give you is retreat from social media. Now I realize that's going to sound like crazy talk to some of you, but listen to me. You really only need to be using one or two social media sites in order to build a major brand. How many of you are out here killing yourself doing Facebook, you know, LinkedIn, Google Plus, Snapchat? How many of you guys are out here doing that? Please stop. Stop the insanity. I want you to figure out where your fish are online, and I want you to spend the time building those relationships there. Just because something else is new doesn't mean you need to be doing it. It's really all about where you are engaging your fans. And all businesses have two things, right? Limited time and limited resources. So you might as well pick a marketing plan that's going to work to actually find the fish that you're looking for. Because social media is great, right? The whole point of social media is what? Drive path back to your website, right? So it goes right back to what we started with. But you don't need to be doing everything in order for it to make sense for your business. Now, the next thing I want you guys to think about after you think about social media is I want you in 2017 to roll out at least one new content strategy. So if you've been doing blogging for a while, it's time to mix it up. Perhaps you should think about launching a podcast. Maybe you should be thinking about video. But whatever it is, what you've been doing, you need to ramp it up. If you've been blogging two days a week, start blogging three days a week. You just want to make sure that you are engaging people every way that they consume information. You don't want to lose any opportunities. But you also want to pace yourself because creating a new content strategy Creates, is going to create a lot of work. So you've got to make sure that it's something that you're going to be able to keep up. Because how awful is it to go to somebody's podcast and see that they did one podcast in six months? That's a waste of time. And that's not going to help you market anything. So you want to make sure that you really think through your new content strategy. But here's the thing I want to tell you about content. Long form content is king. And when I say long form con content, I'm talking about blog posts that are 2,000 words or more, blog posts that have lots of pictures and interactive content in them. 
You don't want to just, you know, that 600 or 700 word blog post, that's not going to get it anymore. It's really about your long form content and the different types of content that's really going to make all the difference. The next thing I want you to think about is a recency strategy. And recency is about once someone does business with you, you need to survey them. They should hear from you within seven to 10 days of doing business with you. And what should you ask them? Number one, did you like your product or service? And oh, by the way, if you liked it, would you consider giving us a review or recommendation? And when you do that, the link to give you that review on Yelp or the link to give you that recommendation on LinkedIn should be embedded right there in that email. Make it easy for them. Don't make, it go, don't make them go look for it, right? How many of you, the last time you stayed in a hotel, within a week got an email, hey, would you mind giving us a review on TripAdvisor? Yeah, you want to be doing the same kinds of marketing for your own business, and we call that a recency strategy. Now, the next thing that I want you all to think about is retargeting is the new paid search. Nobody wants to be sold to. We know that 70, 80% of web users ignore Google ads. When you go search for something, do you click on the top three ads? I don't, and most people don't. So you want to figure out if someone has come and checked out something on your website, retargeting gives you the ability to go find these people the rest of the places they go on, online. And retargeting is showing a six times higher conversion rate than regular banner ads and you know regular paid search. So what is retargeting? Well, retargeting works two ways. You can do it through Google AdWords or you can do it through Facebook ads. But it really involves having a pixel of people who visit your website or it involves you dumping your email list into their program and then targeting people who are already on your email list who already are familiar with your brand. This is the new paid search and it really is converting. And if you're thinking about where you should be spending your money on paid search online in 2017, retargeting, retargeting, retargeting. Now, I told you that at the very beginning of this talk that there was one thing that you should be thinking about more than anything else if you want to build better relationships with your customers going into 2017, and that's video. You need to re-engage with customers using video. You know, Facebook Live has unleashed the quick and dirty video revolution. <laughs> Have you guys seen people that you've never even thought of on Facebook telling you in the car where they're on their way going, where they're doing? Well, if you got intentional about selling something to someone and building that one-on-one -on -one engagement, there is no better way to build a connection with a prospective or existing customer than video. And there's lots of ways to do it. You've got platforms all over the place from, you know, Google Hangout certainly started it. You've got Skype, you've got, um, you know, Periscope, Blab, Facebook Live. I mean, there's lots of platforms. Certainly there's tons of people who have created branded YouTube channels. But here's the thing I want you to think about with your branded YouTube channel. Who owns that subscriber list? You own it or do they own it? So you want to think about how you can control video in a different way so that you can use it to build your list, so that you can use it to sell, you can use it to communicate, you can use it to even do your customer service. And I want to have you think about one more statistic that I just heard the other day that shocked me, and it'll probably shock you. By 2020, 85% of all of our sales and customer communication will be done via social media or video. So get on the video revolution now because you only got three years to get ready before it's all the rage and it's the only way you're going to be able to communicate with your existing and prospective customers. Now with that, I hope you guys have really enjoyed the 10 R's that are going to start your, what did I say? revenue revolution for 2017 in your business. And I'm so excited to bring to the stage Brendan Swartz. He is a co-founder, 
My dear friend, Brendan Schwartz, hey. the co-founder of Wistia, here he is. Let me tell you a little bit about Wistia. Thanks, hey guys. Brendan and his best friend co-founded Wistia, which is a video platform, that, a B2B video platform that you can use to sell, promote, and control, and most importantly, build your own email list to grow your own business. How about that? So he's going to be here, and we're going to talk a little bit about the video revolution that is taking place in business communications today. Brendan, thank you so much for joining yeah, us. Yeah, thank you for having me. Good to see everybody out here. Very psyched to be here. All right. <laughs> now, Brendan, I know that you started Wistia in 2006 with your best friend one year out of undergrad. That's true. And I also probably look like I'm 15 years old. So that may be surprising that it was 10 years ago that we started a business. <laughs> yeah, so tell me about how you guys even you know, came about. I mean, how did you guys stumble upon you know, this, this amazing product that we now know is Wistia that has over 300,000 users? Yeah, um, I think it's probably a common story, but we started with something completely different uh, than where we ended up. We actually started by building a portfolio website for artists, uh, and specifically for filmmakers. Uh, Chris, my best friend from college, he was a filmmaker. We had always collaborated. We were really excited about video. And in 2006, if you remember, that's the time YouTube was just getting started. So uh, I don't know how old everybody is in the crowd here, but if you remember video before YouTube, it was a pretty horrible experience. You would need to download Real Player, QuickTime. It wouldn't work half the time. And there was a huge shift once Adobe Flash became very pervasive that you could go right to YouTube and watch a video on any computer, any platform. It just worked. And that's something that we saw and we got really excited about being able to do something in the video space. And so for us, that was building a uh, portfolio website for filmmakers and our friends and family said, wait a second, I thought you were starting a business. Uh, a business <laughs> needs to make money. And we we're like, oh, don't no, just shut up, dad. Like it's, uh, you know, 2006, if we get a lot of eyeballs, we'll figure out the business model later. Uh, about maybe six months into that, we were bootstrapped, we were running out of money, we really enjoyed working on it, um, and we were trying to figure out how to make a go of it. And it was around that same time that uh, a good friend of ours was saying, hey, I know you guys have built all this video technology, um, I have a problem in my company, I'm, I work at a medical device company, and we record all this video, and we need to share it with the clinical sites and with our headquarters in Watertown, Massachusetts. And so they were sending, again, this is a long time ago, they're FedExing DVDs all over the country. And they have a site in Chile, and it takes two days to, to send something to Watertown, Mass. There's not anything overnight. So he said, can you please help me with this? And we're like, no, man, we're for artists. Like, we're not going to sell out. We can't build something for businesses. And um, eventually we got, we started talking to other people who are in our network, and we got the light bulb kind of went on when we saw the same problem in the film industry, where you need to do reviews and approvals. So there was a use case for private video sharing, um, and for training, and for, for sales. And so we were always attracted to building something that was uh, kind of a broad and useful product around video, and so we set, finally agreed to sell out and uh, said, what the heck? And we went in to meet with this company, and then we, we signed them on as uh, the first paying customer. And that was a really big shift for us because we went from this mode of, if you build it, they will come, to we can build valuable software if we get in front of people, we can show them that. Um, and, and that's kind of, that's how we started. Awesome. So, I, you know, one of the things that I advise people all the time is don't hire somebody you can't fire, right? <laughs> And you started a business 10 years ago with your best friend. So how, how does that work? Like, who, who does what in the business? How did you guys not, like, duke it out and kill each other? Like, what, you know, tell us how that has worked for you. Yeah, that's, I feel very fortunate that we are still best friends. We spend an unreasonable amount of time together. We live together. While we were starting the business, we lived together. Uh, we still live about two blocks away from each other and walk to work every day. It's very, it's very cute. Um, uh, I, I guess we always approached it 
um, even whether we, we knew it at the beginning or not, that it was, this is gonna sound like a cliche, but it is very true that it was uh, friendship first and business second, which I feel like you get a lot of the opposite advice. You know, this is a business, feelings don't matter, friendship doesn't matter, and I would say that was, and that still is, you know, it takes a lot of work. Even though we're really good friends, we tend to agree on almost everything. There are times when we disagree, um, but it matters so much to actually fix everything and to, to work on it. I mean, people say starting a business is uh, like being married, right? It, it sure it takes, enough is. <laughs> it, it, yeah, it takes work, it's not always easy. Um, and I think for us, the friendship first piece has been what has kept it, kept it together. Well, that's great. Well, I know that you have a particular mission. You believe that video is the way to make a human connection. And I know that's been very important to you as you've built up your business. Um, tell me how you incorporate that with, you know, you guys are growing pretty exponentially at this point. How have you kept that, that human element in your business? Yeah, that's something, well, I feel like uh, we were talking earlier about mistakes that we've made over the years. And one that we were fortunate to learn pretty early on is that, uh, and I think it's a pretty common one, is when we were smaller and we were this ragtag group in a, uh, a, a office above a paint or picture framing store in the middle of nowhere in Massachusetts, we were pretty afraid to actually you know, say we're just four people, uh, you know, here's what we're doing, we're making this software product, and so we tried to pretend to be something that we weren't. You know, we had the fancy bio on the website where it says, Brendan Schwartz, co-founder and CTO, uh, graduate of Brown University with a fancy degree in engineering and 15 years experience, which was probably made up, because if you counted all, you know, experience making websites in middle school, you would put that on there. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, we thought we were doing the right thing by, by trying to project what we wanted to be, but the odd thing is that wasn't, if you had ever talked to any of us in person, we would never say something like that. Um, and it was maybe a year or so after that, uh, another person who worked at Wistia, it was his birthday, and as kind of as a joke, uh, we took the team page, which is this extremely boring bios of people with no pictures, no nothing, just a wall of text, and turned it into, it was a photo of everybody who worked in the company, and if you typed dance on your keyboard, it would play a girl talk song and there would be uh, strobe lights and then our pictures would animate and dance in a very awkward way. And he really enjoyed it and then we shared it to a few friends on the internet um, and it ended up getting spread pretty widely. And it was this really, like, it was a really nice moment for us where we, this was us being ourselves and it actually, had a very positive effect for the business. And there's just been a lot of moments like that where every time, and we still make these mistakes where we try to pretend that we're something that we're not, but I think when we can remember to do that, and that's a big part of why our mission is to make business more human, that people build relationships with humans. And humans don't always do everything perfectly. You know, they're not, like, people are, this is gonna sound kind of, this is where I get kind of corny and stuff, but you no, know, but people are vulnerable, people make mistakes, and when you can admit that, there are chances to build trust, and video is a really emotive medium, like you were saying. Sure. Short and being, from being in the same room as somebody, it's the best way to express yourself, and um, it, it is, been really nice to see business success from being ourselves and to help other people do, do that as well. Now, I have to tell you, as a former television producer in my first life before I became an entrepreneur 17 years ago, I have a bugaboo about user-generated content, <laughs> about you know folks whipping their Facebook, you know, kind of their phone out and being like, hey, I'm walking down the street and this is what I'm doing. Like, that personally makes me crazy. But, I want to know, as, as, as the founder of a company that helps people promote their videos to promote their business, what is your thought about professional video versus user-generated, I'm just whipping my phone out, I don't know what the lighting's like, I'm just bouncing around, I'm recording my footage. What, you know, where, where are you on the meter of what works and what doesn't? Yeah, I think that's a really good question and We've seen in the past 10 years, um, people have been really focused on making very professional content, and it's specifically for marketing content, because 
you have, like you were talking about, a beautiful web page that you've worked hard to design, it works well on mobile, uh, and you are going to put a video on there. It has to look as good as the rest of your website. So we spent a lot of time teaching and helping people to make more professional looking video so it fits in with the rest of your brand. But I think that's not the whole story and that we're seeing some really interesting cases where using something that perhaps isn't as highly produced, where it's not well lit necessarily, it's not scripted, um, these more authentic moments, that those actually have a place in business too. And I think you were, you were touching on some of this, but what we're seeing from where we are, I think we'll see in 2017 a huge shift towards people using what we've been calling one-to-one -one and authentic videos in business. And we see a ton of companies doing this already uh, really successfully, which is imagine uh, we do a sales call and then I send you a follow-up video. It probably shouldn't be really heavily produced because you're gonna think, what, something's up with this. It's, right. uh, it's a trick. If it's more something that looks like I could have sent you on Snapchat or something that is familiar, or I said, hey, it's Brendan, I just wanted to put a face to the name, it's really great to talk to you, that's a really, uh, is a really powerful way to build that relationship, and we're seeing companies do that and having a lot of success um, on the sales side with it, and it's, it's really cool to see that. So can you give us an example of another way that people are using, you know, this. just like, you know, kind of like quickly, hastily kind of done video and it's, and it's working for them? I can see that I hang up from a sales call, I send a video, hey, Brenda, it was so nice to talk to you. We're really excited about this project. Let us know how we can help. I attach, uh, you know, my proposals, attach this email, give us a call. I mean, I can see that being effective and being quick, but, what about if you're just doing the, I've never heard of you, and now I'm going out and I'm doing a search, and I find how to hire an accountant, and there's just somebody there on their couch kind of talking to me about, well, this is what I did. I mean, is that really working for people? I, we have seen that work. I mean, hanging out on the couch, <laughs> real casual, being like, yeah, <laughs> you know, I think that's, that's tricky, but there, we've seen a ton of small businesses who have built really engaging content and is not professionally shot. Um, there's a customer we've had for a long time. Uh, his business is called Wisegrass. He is from Pennsylvania and he does landscaping. And he is, he ha I mean, he happens to be quite engaging on camera, but he's shooting it with his phone like this and he is talking to you about how to prepare your lawn uh, in the fall so it's gonna look great in the spring and the summer. And I think if you, are authentic and you have a really strong message and good content, it does not matter how that is shot. I mean, granted, you don't want horrible shadows on your face and looking horrible, but I think the production quality matters a lot less than the message and how it's presented. All right, so I got another video question, of course. How long should videos be? Because I've seen... The shorter the better. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I tell people two minutes or less, but I was curious as to what you thought. Because I'm always curious when, you know, major corporations sell us stuff in 30 seconds, why people think they need five minutes to teach you something. Yeah, it, I think that's also a reason why it's really important to track that. Um, and so with Wistia or with other platforms, you can get what's called an engagement graph or survival curve, and you can see as someone's watching your video, where do they drop off? So if I have a five minute video and 25% of the people are there, are left at minute four, I probably, they're not gonna hear whatever that message is. Sure. And it's interesting, we've also done um, a bunch of, because we have so much data on this, we've looked across all the videos on our platform and done some testing and have, fa have, have found scientifically that shorter videos, a, a shorter video, say you have a one minute video and a two minute video. Uh, of roughly the same content. There'll be more people getting to the end of that minute video than getting to the minute mark of the two minute video. So almost just for the fact that it's longer, and you, you can kind of you know, intuitively look at that as we watch videos, if it's a little bit boring and there's a lot left, right, you probably leave, that shows up in the statistics and the numbers. So the shorter the better, for sure. Now what about graphic inserts in videos or offers inside videos? Are you starting to see people do almost like in-app offers in videos where they're actually converting? Yeah, I think that can be pretty powerful. And again, I would just say the measurement of that is key because sometimes, especially when you're starting out, it's hard to know. 
Um, what we've seen be effective is, again, using uh, that engagement graph. And you'll see sometimes there'll be a section of your video that people will be re-watching, perhaps. So maybe uh, you're showing off a software product and people are re-watching one section. That could be a chance to add something, maybe a link out to explain that further or to re-edit the video to make that part longer. Um, but certainly, I think it comes down to, to measure and iterate when it comes to call to actions inside a video. But, mm -hmm. but they are very effective. Now, call to actions at the end, call to actions in the middle. Where, do you, where, do, you, where do you put your call to action? That is also a great Tell question. Tell us, oh wise one. Tell <laughs> us. We have, I mean, also, I should say, if you are interested in this, uh, on our, we publish a lot of content on our blog about this that goes more in depth through the numbers. So if you are making video and you're thinking about putting calls to action in and want to know exactly how that breaks down, I guess what I'm saying is that will be better than my, than my memory <laughs> right now. Um, but I think it really depends on the content so, and, and the tone that you're trying to do. We do a lot of things where we put a call to action at the end that says, if you enjoyed this video and you would like to know more, to sign up for our newsletter, please fill out your email. That's a lot different than something at the start that says, please put in your email to watch this video. Of course, the latter one will perform better. Um, and we've also seen the best performing ones are where you have a little bit of content, like a teaser bit, and then you throw up an email gate and say, hey, to watch the rest of this, you know, we'd really appreciate that you put in your email address. Those perform the best. But again, oh, it, it comes down to, I think your brand and, and what, you know, obviously if you just gate all your content, probably people. Will irritate more. people. Yes, exactly. Right. Yeah. But, but the teaser content and throwing up a little, hey, if you like this, give me your email. Yeah, that has been, we've seen that be really effective. And if you start doing that and then you can produce your videos in such a way that it lends itself to doing that, it's really powerful. Right, you do have to be intentional about it. You don't want to do after the fact. Just in the, the middle fact, of a word. After yeah. the fact, just <laughs> try to chop it. Now, I want to talk to you a little bit more about your business. And I know that um, at, at a certain point in your business, you guys did end up taking uh, some venture capital funding. And I wanted to know about, you know, sort of like how you made that decision and, you know, would you, would you make that decision again? You know, kind of like just talking about when you're ready to grow your business and you realize that you need more funding. How, do you, how did you guys like kind of go about doing that? And even, you know, where did you even find the person that ended up, you know, giving you some money? Yeah, we, um, so it was, it was just Chris and I in our, or in my bedroom in our 10-person house. We had gotten to the point where we were barely profitable. Um, we were paying our rent. We were, you know, we were surviving, but we were not, the business was not growing really quickly. And so that was an interesting moment where we were like, okay, we exist, we're not going away, um, and we had met some other people, um, somebody who was in sales, uh, who was much older and, and wiser than us, uh, someone else who was kind of a jack of all trades, uh, who's really good at engineering, and these were people that we were really excited to bring onto the business, uh, and we thought we could grow a lot faster if we had them. However, they had families, they needed to make money, unlike us, who were 23 at the time, and that's when we started thinking about raising money for our business to be able to bring them on and to grow more quickly. And it's hard to even remember all the, what went into that. I remember being on the whiteboard and trying to sketch out all the different trajectories of the business. Um, but I would say we got, we, we ended up raising angel, money from angel investors. Okay. Um, and we raised two rounds of angel money we still maintain, Chris and I maintain control of the business um, along with everybody who works inside the business. And that's something that's been really important to us. I think we, um, the slightly longer story is after we raised that first round of money, we were very convinced that we were going to be wildly profitable in <laughs> <laughs> about three months time. Uh, because we had just, we had brought on these two people that had started working with us one guy sold a deal to Nestle Nutrition for $10,000, and we were like, oh, this is easy peasy. Uh, we raised that money, and then we did not sell a thing for an entire summer. And so this was looking like a really bad decision for us because we had, you know, now we were burning money, as they say, mm -hmm. in, the, in the business, 
and we're not selling anything. We started to get traction selling our product at a much lower price point, kind of by the end of that summer. I remember um, Adam, who was <laughs> doing sales at that time, got off the phone with someone and he said, guys, I got great news, I sold, I sold a deal. And we're like, all right, the, uh, we've, we've, we've done it. We're like, what did, who did you sell to? And there was this machine company in Canada that he had been talking to for a while. And he's like, I sold it to this machine company. We're like, great, we're like, how much is the deal? He said, $12 a month. We're like, uh-oh, <laughs> this is a problem. He's like, and also, by the way, it's not for this company. It's for his uh, son's hockey team. Uh, <laughs> he wanted to privately share videos. <laughs> but that is a kind of comical story. But that we shifted towards selling things at a lower price um, to businesses and started moving into a more self-service mode. And we quickly started picking up more customers. And it was around that same time that we were about to run out of money and raised that second, that second round of money. And we were really, really j just set on becoming profitable after that because it was a very horrible feeling to feel like we were out of control and not in control of our destiny. Um, and I would say money is a tool to grow your business. It's, I don't have a you know, dogma against venture capital or raising money, but uh, for us having that control has been extremely important and that's something we care a lot about keeping. So when did you get to the point where you felt like all the hard work was worth it? I guess it, I don't, it this is a cheesy answer. It always felt like that. I think that, um, like I said, when we were building the filmmaking site uh, and we had no prospects and no, m making no money whatsoever, the thing that we were excited about was it was fun to work on this, it was fun to solve these hard problems. And it has, I mean, I feel very fortunate that has, it has always felt that way. I mean, it's also been helpful um, running the business with a really good friend because I, I, could, I definitely could not do this by myself as, I mean, a lot of business owners in the audience, there are very low lows and high highs and it is very helpful to have somebody to pull you out of the low low uh, and someone to celebrate with on that, but it has been, at least for us, in it, kind of an enjoy the journey uh, situation. And if, <laughs> it still feels like that there's so much more to do. Um, I guess it's this weird combination of we have had a lot of success, but also, you know, the next day you might look at your business and say, there's so much more that we want to do here. There's so much, we're, we're a tiny company, we could grow so much more. Well, what is you guys' big goal for 2017? We are very excited. So th this one-to-one -one video that I'm talking about, we have, for the history of our business in 10 years, we have been plagued by this problem, and this is uh, where in order to use Wistia, you need to have a video, which a lot of people have videos. More people are making videos. But especially in the early days, that was really difficult because you'd talk to some businesses. I don't know how many people are making videos in the audience, but it's not, not everybody has videos. And the thing that is really exciting to see businesses who are using this casual video, um, even screen recordings, videos of their webcam, building authentic connections with their audience. Those are things where you don't, you don't need to come in with a professionally produced video or have this big plan or hire a firm to do that. And we are thinking a lot about and starting to make some tools to allow you to really easily make video. And not only that, but use them in the places that it's natural to use them. So you'd be in Gmail and you want to send a video. You can make it right there and send it and track that. So those are that is something that we're really excited about um, and working on for 20s. Well, we're working on it now. But it'll be ready <laughs> in 2017. <laughs> All right, so I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about what do you thought the top three trends are gonna be for 2017 in terms of marketing? In terms of marketing? I'm so, f I'm sorry, I'm so focused on video. I, ha I mean, I'm <laughs> obviously very biased, but I think we will see uh, and I said it already, but the one-to-one -one authentic videos, I think you're gonna start seeing a lot more of those in your inbox. I think anybody here should start exploring that and thinking about how you can use that to make better relationships with your customers or with prospects. I think that is going to be a very big trend. 
I think the other thing that we're starting to see is, and this is not marketing specific, but video being used in all parts of the business. So not just marketing, not just sales, using it in support to build stronger relationships um, and in all kind, and in, internally to, uh, to inside your company. Um, I don't know what I don't know what the third trend is. I am I'm skeptical for uh, this is not the, uh, an anti-trend, but I think live is really exciting. I'm skeptical how useful it will be for business for the mass adoption for businesses mm. in 2017. But I think that's something to watch to keep an eye on um, and to figure out how that can be. That's something that we care a lot about. Keeping an eye on that and seeing, I feel like 2018 might be the year of live for for small businesses for for all of us to use. Oh, that's interesting. That's interesting. I would have thought that you would have said live, like the, the, to me, Facebook Live has just ignited this revolution of people, even more narcissism is available <laughs> to you, um, you know, where people just letting you know their every thought and even how they're going on their way to where they're going to do their next thing. Um, so it's interesting that, that you're not sure whether or not there's a real business application for that. I think, yeah, I think business, the trends that we've seen in, in business, at least for video, have followed consumer behavior and tend to lag behind them by quite a bit, just mm -hmm. as businesses are slower, slower to adopt. And I think, I think in, for good reason, want to see ROI, want to see something work, and then I think we're all really good at emulating that when we find it. Um, I think we've seen some big businesses use live really well. I think there's some uh, niche cases around product launches, of course for internal meetings, things like that. But um, I haven't seen it yet be used at tons and tons of different cases where live um, is, is being used by businesses. And I think part of the reason is it's kind of scary to be on camera, <laughs> if we're honest. So yeah. if you make uh, a one-to-one -one video to send to a prospect and I say something that is stupid, I can just delete that video and record another one. If right. you're doing it live, if you're doing it live. It's live. It's live. <laughs> right. Right, we learned today that sometimes live doesn't, doesn't work so well, right? But you gotta roll with the punches and, you, and you've gotta be authentic. And you know, I think the number one thing when I think about what's gonna happen in the future is you still have to figure out how to be unique, right? You know, no one's looking for a Me Too brand, no one's looking for information that they already know. So as there's more and more ways, more and more channels to spread your information or be what we call you know, idea entrepreneurs, it's gonna be interesting to see how people are able to you know, get above the prey and stand out if everyone is doing it. And that's the thing that I think is gonna be even interesting. But I do still feel like at the end of the day, before there was SEO, before there was YouTube, before there was any of this stuff, there was great content. And if you build a better mousetrap, the world will be the path to your door, right? I think that's very well said. So does anyone have any questions in the audience? We have a few more minutes. If any of you all have a question for, for Brendan or myself. Do you do anything with the uh, 360 video or VR? In your uh, yeah, the question is, do we do anything with 360 video or VR? Um, yes, that is another thing. I'm, 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 I'm obviously a nerd. I'm an engineer, so that is very exciting to me. Um, I think. I have been really impressed. So we launched, uh, we added 360 video to our platform at the start of this year, uh, mostly on the thesis that this is gonna be a big thing, I think it is a very long-term play for us. But we thought if we could do this, if we could have businesses using this, we wanted to be there and have it in our product to help understand and teach people. And I have been really surprised to see really legitimate use cases of businesses who are using 360 video. Um, so some examples of that are a car dealerships are using that, nobody wants to go on a car lot and have kind of the you know, used car salesman experience. I've seen uh, the people who are doing that say it's been really successful for them because people can go and explore the inventory on their own without feeling like there is this sales pressure. Um, other people who are using it successfully, uh, tourism, kind of adventure travel, where you get a really good sense of what it is to be in another place. I think the pro and con of 360 video is it gives you a really uh, 
you can't doctor it up. There's no lighting. It's recording everything around you, so it gives you a really clear picture of what it is to be in another experience or be somewhere else. That's also the hard, the hard part for it. But I think that's a, that's a really interesting thing to watch, and it's, I've been really surprised how businesses are being creative and using that successfully. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, I think. How long? I think people are doing 10 second roll ins and roll outs of videos all the time. 10 seconds, if you got 10 seconds of information and it's powerful, it can go viral. So I, I personally don't think they're. The young lady in the gray shirt that had your hand up, stand up, please, because I can barely see you. <laughs> My personal business opinions of Vine shutting down? Business or personal? Or personal, personal opinions? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right, don't tweet this. I'm pretty sad about it on a personal level. I feel like that really pioneered, I mean, I, Vine is its own medium that now has been co-opted by other things, but basically that kind of like short looping uh, video. I think people did crazy creative stuff with it. Uh, I never really saw a huge business, business success or adoption of it, so I don't know that it's a sad thing for businesses, but I think there's a lot to learn there. I mean, particularly about the question of is there sh too short content, right? right. Uh, if you can get your message across in something that that Six is- Six seconds. Yeah, short Absolutely. and poignant, um, I think it's a really interesting place to play around. Okay, we got lots of people. I haven't gone to this side of the room. Blue shirt, right there, you. Point, beside the lady in the, the teal blouse, you. Yeah. <laughs> what kind of results have you seen from the uh, uh, Tesla and Bennett and the Facebook Marketplace that you've seen? SEO embedded videos? Um, that's a good question. So, um, I mean, Linda, you touched on this a little bit with YouTube in terms sure. of owning the audience or not owning the audience. One, people, one reason people use a platform like Wistia or, or other ones like it is so that when people are searching for your content, you can get that traffic to your site. Right. Um, so <laughs> obviously if you have a video that is on YouTube and a video that is on your site, the one on YouTube will outrank the one on your site because, I mean, for fairly obvious reasons. Traffic, um, traffic, yeah. So we've seen people, uh, you can get, we ha video does help boost rankings um, and it, we've seen people do it successfully where They'll either won't use YouTube if they want to get that traffic on their site and have that video content on their site, um, or kind of divide their content and use YouTube for things like how-to videos, uh, educational content that works well there, or teaser content, and then have longer form um, things on their website that are deeper in the funnel so that you can kind of create that, get the traffic you want to your website. Um, but it, it, is, it is very effective. All right, over here where you guys are grimacing. Yeah, you. So his question was, does Wistia integrate with other business applications, I'm assuming you mean like email, CRM, is that what you're talking about? Okay. I feel like you're planted in the audience for this, <laughs> this question. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's a big thing, that, that's something that's been really important to us and I think is hugely powerful uh, when you can get the video viewing data in context with other business data. So we'll integrate with marketing automation providers like HubSpot, Marketo, Pardot, so that you would see who is watching your video and how much they're watching, or, so, or integration with CRM. So if you pull up uh, Melinda's record in the CRM, you might see all the different videos that she watched. Now, you didn't mention Infusionsoft. We do, <laughs> we were talking about this this morning. All right, all right. I'll be going Come to Infusionsoft now. tomorrow to talk about a deeper <laughs> integration with them. But Good. we do, in the list building category, if you use Wistia to uh, use what we call Turnstile, which is an email gate, uh, we have integrations with almost everybody, including Infusionsoft, to send those emails into those providers so you can build an audience and build a list that you own. So uh, always looking for more ways to integrate. Let me know if you have more ideas. There was a question right there in the middle. Sometimes people like, if it's seven minutes, they get, they get bored. You know what I mean? 
That's a, yeah, I'm not sure if I can answer that in a, in a generic way, but I think that's why it's important, I mean, this is a cop-out, I suppose, a little bit, but it's important to measure for your content, because we also see plenty of content that is hour-long webinars that will be 85% engagement, holding engagement, because it's so targeted to that audience. So I think that's why it's so important to measure, to know, did you get that impedance match with the audience and the content? And there's always A-B testing. I mean, you can always try a three-minute version and a seven-minute version of the content and see, you know, if you get on Wistia and you can use their tracking tool, you can see what people are converting to. But I'm of the mindset less is more. Less is always more. Yeah. All right, last question in the back. I'm having trouble hearing you. Stand up. I'm, what is the future of photography, photography, in video? You mean like integrated with video? Okay. Oh, using uh, photography and, and turning it into video? Or separate? Oh, interesting. I'm not sure I know the answer to that question. Hmm, inquiring minds want to know. All right, we're going to have to put a pin in that one because <laughs> I don't have an answer for you either. All right, one last question. I saw a couple of hands. Okay, so she asked a question about when you go into a pitch meeting for funding, how much information should you be sharing about your business, and is it appropriate to ask people to sign non-disclosure agreements? Um, I, well, let me first disclaimer, I'm not an expert on raising money, and the last time that we did this was many, many years ago. Um, I'm not generally a big believer in non-disclosure agreements, and that anything, uh, that I wouldn't want someone, you know, it is confidential, I wouldn't want someone to repeat, probably. I think non-disclosure agreements are a kiss of death for you. I, I honestly believe if you're in a pitch meeting, you really shouldn't be sharing exactly how your IP works, but I'm assuming that you would have checked out the people that you're going to meet with and they're reputable business people. If you can't find anything about them online, that's a super clue that you probably shouldn't be meeting with them. So my suggestion would be, you know, these people are looking for a great idea to invest in, and you better give it your best shot, and, you know, but obviously don't share exactly how your sausage gets made, because that's a little bit scary. All right, thank you all so much. Brendan, thank you so much yeah. for joining me on stage. Thank you, thank you. And for those of you that are interested in my 10 R's, it'll be up on my blog next Monday. So all you have to do is Google Small Business Lady, and you get a little bit more information about what I talked about today. Thank you all so much. Thanks.